Thank you for joining us here today on Hill Country Happenings News Minutes. The Duke University Talent Identification Program for the fourth and fifth grade students is a nonprofit organiza organization dedicated to serving academically gifted and talented students. The Duke TIP works with students, their families, and educators to identify, recognize, challenge, engage, and help students reach their highest potential. To participate, students must have scored a 95% or higher on a standardized achievement aptitude or mental ability assessment. Now the following students at New Albany Elementary School qualified and has enrolled with Duke TIP. The fourth and fifth grade talent search includes Ezekiel Brooks, Eli Bernadette, Maddox Conwell, Colin Kirksley, Christopher Knox, Stephanie Nolan, Jason Ross, and Nora Breath Stroop. Congratulations! As of April the 24th, there were 5,718 cases of the COVID virus, and there have been 221 deaths in Mississippi so far. The CDC recommends that everyone can do their part by helping respond to the emerging public health threat by following these recommendations. Wear a cloth face covering in public and settings to avoid spreading COVID-19 to others in case you are infected but do not have symptoms. The cloth face cover is meant to protect other people in case you're infected. The cloth face coverings recommended are not surgical masks or N95 respirators. Those are considered critical supplies that should be reserved for healthcare workers and other first responders. The cloth face covering is not a substitute for social distancing. Now the CDC continues to recommend that people try to keep about six feet between themselves and others. And the White House slow the spread are in place until April the 30th. Now these are a part of the nationwide effort to slow the spread of the COVID-19 through the use of social distancing at all levels of society. And on April the 16th, the White House re released guidelines for opening up America again, a phased approach to help state and local officials reopen their economies, get people back to work, and continue to protect American lives. Now, the COVID-19 has a different background, and it was caused by a new coronavirus. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that are common in people and many different species of animals, including camels, cattle, cats, and bats. Rarely animal coronaviruses can infect people and then spread between people, such as the MERS COVID and the SARS COVID. Now, with this new virus named SARS-CoV-2. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a beta coronavirus, like the MERS and the SARS, and all three of these viruses have their origins in bats. The sequences from the U.S. patients are similar to the one that China initially posted, suggesting a likely single recent emergence of this virus from an animal reservoir. Early on, many of the patients at the epicenter of the outbreak in Wuhan, China, had some link of a large seafood and live animal market, suggesting animal-to-person spread. Later, a growing number of patients reportedly did not have exposure to animal markets, indicating person-to-person -person spread. Now, the person-to-person -person spread was reported outside of Wuhan and to other countries outside of China, including the United States. Most international destinations now have ongoing community spread with the virus that causes COVID-19, as does the United States. Community spread means some people have been infected and it's not known how or where they become exposed. You can learn more about the spread of the, co the coronavirus at the CDC website. On March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization stated that this virus was not a pandemic, 
meaning the whole world was going to be affected. This is the first pandemic known to be caused by a new coronavirus. In the past century, there were four pandemics caused by the emergence of a new influenza virus. As a result, most research and guidance around the pandemic is specific to influenza, but the same premise can be applied to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Now, pandemics of respiratory disease follow a certain progression outlined in the pandemic interval framework. Pandemics begin with an investigation phase, followed by recognition, initiation, and acceleration phase. The peak of the illness occurs at the end of the acceleration stage, which is followed by a deceleration phase, which is the decrease in the illness. Different countries can be in different phases of the pandemic at any point in time. Also, different parts of the same country can be in different phases of the pandemic. A Governor Tate Reeves issued on Friday a new executive order for Mississippians that he calls Safer at Home, which allows most retail stores to open with certain guidelines but keeps other businesses closed. We are starting out to reopen our economy, he said, but we are not slamming the door wide open. It's not a light switch you turn on and off. It's a dimmer. Governor Reeves said that in addition to public health crisis, the state is facing an historical economic crisis that is particularly cruel to the working class. There is no such thing as a non-essential Mississippian, he said. Every job is essential. It will allow clothing, gift, and other retail locations to open, but owners and managers must take precautions such as sending home sick employees, wearing masks in the common areas, using proper sanitation procedures, providing hand sanitizer for customers, and limiting the number of customers at any given time inside the store. Reeves said that businesses that won't be allowed to open are the ones that generally involve close interpersonal contact, such as movie theaters, museums, casinos, entertainment venues, and gyms. Other businesses that must remain closed are hair salons, tattoo parlors, and spas. We'd like to open things up for everybody, he said, but we're not ready yet. Some businesses will have to stay closed. We want you to open, we're just not there yet. Restaurants will continue to be allowed to serve meal orders for curbside, pickup, and delivery, but the dining rooms and the bars will have to remain closed. Reeves said that just because he's loosening some of the restrictions on the previous shelter-in-place order does not mean that Mississippians should get out more and discontinue social distancing. Non-essential social gatherings of 10 or more are still banned and those that will be allowed must still practice social distancing and other safety measures. He encourages residents to continue to stay home whenever possible and only go out when necessary. We cannot let our guard down, Reeves said. The fight must go on. We are facing a public health crisis threat that is real and it is deadly and it is historically contagious. I don't believe government can shut down churches, but I have asked pastors to be reasonable and not to have in-church services. Reeves said that his new order also allows for doctors to conduct more medical procedures that have been restricted by his previous orders. We are confident our health care system will not be overwhelmed. It is a measured step, State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs said. He said the state is ready to allow certain medical treatments and procedures that have been on hold in the first stages of the pandemic. He said that doctors should treat the most urgent medical needs, but the state is still trying to develop ways to allow for other procedures, especially dental care. Now, we did hear from 
Ed on his range gauge this week, we had 2.76 inches of rain this week. Now the weather this week should be a little cooler than what it has been, and we're hoping for not as much rain, but we'll just have to wait and see. I thank you for joining us here today on Hill Country Happenings News Minutes. We're on all the social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter. You can go to our Facebook page and like and follow us there. When we're on YouTube, be sure to go and subscribe and hit that notification button. We put all of our original programs on there. We're trying to get a thousand subscribers just as fast as we can. And we also have two websites. You can take us anywhere in the world and watch our station on our website, hillcountrynetwork.net. We also have program pages up there. We have bios of all the people that are on the station. And we have a news website called hcntoday.news. Now this is where we cover all of North Mississippi. We were the first in the area to start covering North Mississippi on our news website. We hope you will go and check us out and read a little news. And as always, please email us with any of your news, our events, send us pictures, tell us stories about how you have been taking care of others while staying in place. Has your life changed? Have you slowed down? Share your stories with us. The world wants to know. We hope you'll stay tuned for the rest of the show, and we hope you have a wonderful week. Superman got nothing on me. I'm only one call away. Call me, baby, if you need a friend. I am with the New Albany Police Department, and your first question is What are the procedures you have to follow? Some of our procedures have changed quite a bit since COVID. Uh, this took place. Now we come in every shift, disinfect our cars uh, before the next shift comes in. When I go down to my patrol car, I walk, go through it completely, glycol everything down, go through and disinfect every nook and cranny that I can possibly find on the patrol car. Anything that my hand would naturally touch during shift, I try to get it wiped down. Uh, after we patrol all day and we're fixing to switch shifts with the next shift, we get back out of the patrol car and go back through that same procedure again, going through and wiping down all the instrument panels, the entire car, every little nook and cranny that we can find again, uh, just to make it safe for the next officer that's coming on shift. When the next officer comes on shift, he comes in right behind us and disinfects the car again for a third time. We do all this just to try to keep as, the cards as clean as possible and free from the COVID virus. And to add on to that, um, as you can see, we're not wearing our usual blue uniform that we usually wear. Uh, Chief has actually let us wear our Class C uniform because it is easier for us to be, be contaminated or you get home or whenever we are whenever we have any encounter with somebody that might be infected, it is easier to disinfect our uniforms. And also in de dealing with the public, as you can see, we wear gloves, we, we have masks that we wear. Uh, when, anytime we get a call, getting out with someone, we are taking extra precaution on keeping ourselves safe. Um, we do try to limit our involvement with the public. We, we still do have a job to do, and we do that job. But we're just taking extra precautions to keep ourselves safe and healthy during this uh, trying time. What are some stuff you're facing right now? Well, some of the things we're facing, such as myself, my wife has a compromised immune system. So I have to take every precaution that I can coming home from work and taking and disinfecting all my equipment taking showers, getting everything squared away before I can even have any type of contact with any of my family members, especially my wife. 
is high on the other hand, I have kids of my own. I have one that's got asthma and that's one of my biggest fears, having to bring it home to them and getting my daughter exposed. Um, and also going along uh, the lines that they just talked about, uh, I have kids at home, so I'm, that's always in the back of my mind when I'm here doing a job to go home uh, to make sure I disinfect what I can. That's the first thing I do when I get home, try to disinfect, put my stuff in the wash machine, and try to get anything that I had on that I was wearing when I had to perform my job try to get it sanitized the best I can because I'm thinking of my kids always in the back of my mind. We're trying to keep them healthy. So our, our procedures and protocols for the COVID-19, currently we have uh, dispatcher screening and anytime there's a patient with signs and symptoms, they give us a heads up. Uh, they will call us directly on our uh, radios uh, to give them a public service to call in the dispatch. They tell us uh, that this patient could be positive or is positive, and we dress full PPE, which is uh, N95 uh, masks, face shield, goggles, uh, gown, fully dressed, uh, just for our protection and protection for the patients, just in case that we may be infected because of the fact that there are so many asymptomatic patients, we could be walking around with it. Too. Um, a few things really that we're facing as EMS in a nutshell, um, crew fatigue, um, which really isn't anything out of the norm, um, stress at home, um, on the job, you never really know, you get up and you put your uniform on and you think, is this the day that I get sick, is this the day that I give this to somebody, is this the day that somebody gives this to me. Um, fear of the unknown. You just never really know what the day is going to bring. Um, and on top of your COVID calls, you still have uh, your car wrecks, your heart attacks, your strokes, all of which have to be treated like they have COVID. And it just really adds a completely, a completely different level of stress on top of what's already stressful. First question is, what are the procedures you have to follow? With this COVID-19, well, the first thing is we only send one person to a medical call now, and when they get there, they have to wear their PPE and stand at the door and ask questions related to COVID-19. Masking up on rescues. We have to work. We have to mask up on rescues now. Calls. If we go to the alarm call, we meet the person at the door and ask them uh, if they have what kind of problem they have. If, it, if they say it's, uh, they don't know, we'll, we'll uh, pack two people up and they will go in and check and see what the problem is. The hardest thing is just remembering to stop because we're used to just going, going. and don't ask no questions. But now we're having to slow down and think about more how we're doing it until we're around. Second question is, what are some stuff you're facing right now? Uh, well, me working at the fire department, my wife, she works in the medical field. All the daycare is closed. You know, finding somebody for child care and making sure we're not bringing anything back home. Our kid. Watching people around. It's tough.
I would just like to say thank you to all the doctors and nurses and scientists who are putting their lives on the line for the benefit of others. Thank you to the first responders. Quiero agradecer a todos los médicos y enfermeras por todo su esfuerzo y ayuda durante esta situación tan difícil. All the first responders in the city of New Albany, Mississippi. Thank you for everything you've done. You guys really are helping a lot, and I thank you for that, along with everybody else. What's up, guys? It's Caleb here, and uh, I just want to thank all the first responders and uh, all the medical personnel that are helping out during this coronavirus. We greatly appreciate it. My name is Amaris Mejia, and I want to say thank you to all those who are in the line of support. During these times, they are more difficult, and you are sacrificing a lot of your time to help us. Que Dios los bendiga. The first responders for always being there, and I pray that God gives you courage and strength to keep doing what you're doing. And you know, may God be with you at all times. God bless you all. I want to thank everyone who have risked their lives, especially the first responders during this world pandemic. We appreciate y'all so much and everything y'all have done. May God bless you. I just want to take a second to thank our doctors and nurses and our first responders during this serious pandemic. Y'all just stay safe and healthy out there. Thank you to all the doctors and nurses for what you guys are doing. Este es un agradecimiento para todas las personas que están poniendo sus vidas en riesgo durante esta crisis muy grave. Muchísimas gracias. To all of our first responders for all you have done for us and you're greatly appreciated. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to anyone working as a nurse, first responder, or anything like that. Thank you for working to help us get over this coronavirus. Thank you to all the first responders, the officers, firefighters, medics, doctors, nurses, anybody out there that has to do with this crisis. Thank you for everything you're doing, and stay safe. Due to the COVID-19 virus, we have been unable to attend the Union County Board of Supervisors meeting. On April the 20th, 2020, the agenda is as follows. 1. Approval of month in March 2020 budget report. 2. Amend road fund budget by increasing capital outlay by $14,490 and decreasing working cash by $14,490 to purchase used bucket truck for $8,900, a greater blade for $4,100, and a crane for $1,490, not originally budgeted. Number three, amend general fund, maintenance of building and grounds department budget to allow for treatment of termites at 13 county buildings by increasing contractual services $14,900 and decreasing working cash by $14,900. Number four, approve contract with Terminex for treatment of termites at 13 county buildings in the amount of $14,900 with a maintenance agreement renewal annually at $222 per building or $2,925 for all 13 buildings. Authorization to hire nine, change to 11, part-time employees for solid waste department. Number six, amend solid waste budget by increasing personnel services $75,000 and decreasing working cash by $75,000. Number seven, approve request for cash number 10 in the amount of $5,002 
for ARC grant reimbursement on Martintown Industrial Access Road Project. Number eight, approve interfund loan for $5,002 from General Fund to Martintown North Industrial Fund to pay for expenditures in addition to receiving ARC grant money. Number nine, approval of a manual check for $1,203 payable to the PIPE fund to replenish funds for narcotics. Number 10, authorization to hire part-time employees for dispatcher London Irby. Number 11, discuss quotes on purchasing computers for deputies vehicles. Number 12, approval of medical examiner fees. Five. Number 13, Approval of payment for circuit court vacation term. 14. Approval of March surrendered tag list. 15. Approval of surrendered tag list for January. Number 16. Adjourned to Monday, May the 4th, 2020. <laughs> Today we're going to be... Um I'm going to talk to y'all and show you how to use liquid watercolors. I wanted to show you some examples of some liquid watercolor paintings I've done. This, uh, these are all just things that I kind of just pulled out of a drawer this morning. Um, so you can kind of see what they look like. So um, one thing that I love doing is drawing with first I'll draw with a pencil and then I get a really skinny sharpie which of course I don't have one sitting right here but um, the super skinny ones and then I will like go over all of my pencil and add tons of detail just like really go into it and then um, then I will paint with liquid watercolor on top of that that's important if you're going to do something like that, that you use, you know, a Sharpie or just any kind of permanent ink, because if you use a marker, like a regular marker that's water-based, and then you paint on top of it, the, the marker is going to just kind of smear. So you want to use something permanent. Um, and I believe that after I paint on top of my Sharpie, a lot of this, like in this one, a lot of that detail I did after I painted because you can see where like I splattered paint on this and I went in and like drew a little tiny circle around every splatter of paint. I must have been like having anxiety that day or something because I was like super detailed, which is not usual for me. But that's one. Here's another one that's not so detailed. I um, wish I would have found this one before Easter. This is a drawing I did. It's actually based on a photo of me when I was a child. My paint, someone gave me this gigantic stuffed bunny and they put me on top of a car with the bunny and took my picture and I was obviously terrified of the bunny. I mean, I exaggerated this, but um, see, I gave him those evil teeth. I think bunnies are very creepy and scary, so I've gone like way overboard with making them scary. And then I found this. This was that painting I told y'all about that I did the linoleum block printing based on this. Um, this painting turned out a lot better than our reduction print, that's for sure. Um, and then these are just some others. I don't, these may have a glare on them because they've got um, acetate on top of them, you know, just like just examples that I have here um, this is an example of one uh, a painting I did this is a print of a painting that I did of the uh, trailhead plaza before this was before any of this was there like the lights weren't there the tables and umbrellas weren't there it was just the plaza and it was actually um, when there was like that um, running and bike shop there. So it was a while back. But anyway, I, I drew it with ink and then I painted it and then um, had prints made and did a lot of stuff with that. And then here's one more. I like to draw and paint bugs. So here's what the, the paint that I work with, this is what it's 
what it looks like. It comes in bottles like this. Um, you can buy this kind of paint, this liquid watercolor paint at Hobby Lobby. It's very expensive there and the bottles are really small. I order these paints from a company called Dick Blick. It's like kind of a school supply company. Now they just call it Blick for obvious reasons. But um, this is a, like this is a bottle of black watercolor paint. Um, I've probably been using this bottle for years because this is not my, I don't, this is not school, this is like mine at home. And so I have um, had this forever. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, if you bought a set of these, and like this is how big, I mean, you know, this, it's a lot of paint. If you bought a set of eight liquid watercolor paints from this company, I think it would cost about $30 maybe 40, there's no way you would ever use all of it. Because I will buy a set of these for my classroom and it takes me at least two years to go through it. And that's, you know, like 80 people using liquid watercolor. So it's a great, I mean, and you definitely can't buy all of that at, at Hobby Lobby for um, that amount of money. So if, you, if this is something that you would like to invest in, you definitely need to go online and order a set like just a set of eight from them I wanted to show you all this one because this is actually um, gold they did have metallic sets you can buy um, gold is the only one that I like I, the others are kind of duds but the gold is pretty um, now when you have your palette of paint and this is the palette that I made the other day when I was doing that rooster painting, that Walter Anderson painting that I showed you. And I kept my colors really pure because, um, because of what I was doing, I needed to remember which color I used in which area. And I knew if I used my old palette, there's no way I could keep that straight. So I set up a new palette um, and I did my colors you know, in the spectrum so I could remember if I was using, you know, blue or blue violet or violet. Um, but I wanted to show you this because as after a few days of being liquid, when you put it in your palette, of course it starts drying up. And so this paint is on its way to drying up. It's still pretty liquidy though. Um, but in order to paint with this, all I need to do is just wet the paint again and it comes back to life. So this watercolor paint is only a, let's say I did this Monday, so Monday. It's still kind of, it's kind of gooey in there, but if I just drop in a few drops of water, it comes back to life. Um, but the awesome thing about watercolor this is what it looks like when you paint with it. See how intense the color is? It's really beautiful. Um, but the great thing about the about any kind of watercolors, whether you're using like the Walmart kit that you had in kindergarten, or if you have really fancy paint, is that watercolor never really dies. So this palette, this older palette of mine that I haven't used in, I don't know, a few weeks anyway. I mean, it's totally dry. You know, there's nothing's gonna come out of it. Um, all I have to do is take my paintbrush and put a few drops of clean water in each little well and my paint comes back to life. And that could be, if that had been sitting in my closet for three years, all it needs is a little water. So, you know, some people, this drives them crazy because they feel very, very compelled to make a palette, do a painting, wash out their palette, and then they wash away all of these beautiful colors. Um, and I think that's uh, it's such a waste, and not just a waste of the material, the paint material, 
it's a waste of all of these little colors that are made over here all these little areas that you've mixed and you've made this special little green or this yellow green or this blue green you know you just you throw all of that away and when you're working and you've create like if you're painting a person's portrait and you've got all these different skin colors mixed up over here you know why would you erase those they're there and the next time you do it the next time you come back to work on it there's your paint color you don't have to mix it again so I'm a I'm a big believer in not washing out my palette especially with watercolors um, because there's no need to unless you've just made a huge mess <clears throat> you know when I teach little kids in the summer you know they'll they'll just by the end of class they'll have every bit of this mixed up and it'll just be like a big brown gray blob of water then yes I do wash theirs out but typically I don't wash mine out at all I love palettes like this because they have all of this room to mix color on and it's so awesome to have so much space I need to get a different brush my brush was too skinny um, when you're painting with watercolor it's nice to have a really soft brush like this type of brush you don't want a hard brush you need something that that a lot of water will it'll hold a lot of water like that and also that's just soft and will flow with you I want to show y'all a few techniques using watercolor again I'm using this liquid watercolor you can use any kind just your Walmart Crayola set works great all right there's this is called wet unwet this is a technique that you would use like if you were gonna paint you were doing a big painting and you were doing a sky and you wanted all your colors to be really soft and flow together and you don't really want any brush strokes to show you're trying to fill a large space and you want colors kind of almost like a tie-dye effect it's probably what y'all might think about so what you do is you wet your paper wherever you want the paint to go uh, a lot of people think watercolor is very out of control and you can lose control of watercolor really fast but it's all about where the water is so I'm just putting water in this section right here and now I'm gonna drop in my colors of paint so there's some purple um, here's some blue here's some turquoise and then I can even put more water on top of it to make it flow even more but I'm gonna hold this and you see how my color is moving around but it's only going where I put the water it's not coming over here now it would if I just held it up and just shook it or just you know kind of forced it to go but it's really it really is very controlled in that it's only going to go where I'm allowing it to go with water um, so the more water you use the less control you have but sometimes you want this look you know that would be a beautiful sky um, it's something you know you, you would use less water when you're doing things that are more detailed and where you need like very fine control so that is wet on wet wet paper and remember when you're doing wet on wet that initial wetting of the paper your brush needs to be clean and your water needs to be clean you probably can't see right now but I, I started with clean water I've only dipped my brush in a couple of times here but it's definitely um, to your benefit when you're painting with watercolor that you change your water frequently because your water can get really muddy and it will absolutely change the color of your paint I mean because really it's just like a big old bucket of paint when you're doing you know, watercolors all right so the next technique is called wet and dry that's when you're using really wet paint but your papers dry that's more like what I did earlier it's definitely more controlled um,
You can do all kinds of stuff with it. But I want you to see what happens when you're painting. Let's say if I were doing this painting and I wanted to keep doing these stripes, I want you to see what happens when I paint a stripe and it runs into this wet. It's still the same effect of the wet on wet. So now these, this has crept into this wet area there, which I mean, you know, looks pretty cool actually, but it might not be what you wanted it to be. And a lot of times people just um, are really, really sad <laughs> when they're, when two areas combine together that they did not really want to combine together. Um, the good thing is watercolor dries super fast and you just have to be patient. So like if you were doing, imagine if you were doing a coloring book page and you were painting with uh, liquid water or watercolors period. You know, you might have to paint the sky up here and while it's drying, you skip down to the bottom and you paint the grass. You wouldn't start painting a tree on top of this sky right now because if you did, this is what's gonna happen. Like if this were my, if I decided right now I wanna paint a tree here, it's just all gonna bleed together into, into one glob. Right now it doesn't look terrible, but you know, it's, it's usually a disaster. So you wanna let, you wanna let your layers dry before you get too close to one another. Um, and again, you know, like this paint right here that I did just a minute ago, I mean, see, it's already basically dry. Not this, not this area where there's a lot of paint. Okay, and then the last thing is called dry and dry. That's the last technique that, um, that I'll talk about today. And that's when you're doing really detailed things and you, you know, again, the amount of water determines everything. So um, just the tiniest amount of water on your brush, just enough to make your paint work pretty much. And then you're working on a totally dry surface. So this would be like if you were painting, you know, blades of grass or eyelashes or, you know, freckles, you know, anything that you're doing where you want tiny, very detailed little lines. I wanna show you what happens when I get more water on my brush. See now, it's not so dry. I've got more water and my lines are getting bigger. So- Could um, we just use like regular paint and just put water on it? Or you can, that, you can uh, thin, you can thin acrylic paint down. Um, it's still acrylic paint. Um, I do that a lot. Sometimes when I'm painting on things and I, I want the effect of watercolor, but I know I need to use acrylic paint because of whatever I'm painting on, I will water down my um, acrylic paint and I get the same effect. Um, it may take a little bit of tinkering around with it and practicing, um, but yes, you can totally do that. Like, um, I was I'm trying to think of what I painted on. I painted on something. I think it was like a Bible or something. And the outside of it, I was trying to get that look, but I knew if I would have painted watercolors on it, there's nothing I could really seal it with that would make it permanent, whatever I was doing. And so that's what I did. I just watered down acrylic paint. Um, however, Using watercolors is very fun. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun to do. Now, um, this type of paper is actually specific watercolor paper. It's made to hold water. Um, it's a little nicer. Well, it's a lot nicer than just a sheet of regular, you know, like copy paper. It's thicker. You can kind of tell by the way it sounds, you know, that it's thicker. Um, I can tear it too, and you can kind of see the thickness of it. But um, you can buy really, you can spend a lot of money on art supplies. Um, 
I took a watercolor painting class one time and I bought this one sheet of paper and the sheet of paper, and it was big, it was like the size of a poster, but I was in college and I had to pay $20 for that sheet of paper. And I don't, I don't know if I ever used all of that paper up I w because I was so intimidated by spending that much money on a, on a piece of paper for a project, you know? So instead of like doing a big painting, I kept cutting like little tiny pieces and I did all these tiny paintings because I was so scared I was gonna mess up my expensive watercolor paper. Um, but you can also go to Walmart and buy a pad of watercolor paper for, you know, probably three or four dollars. And it's totally lovely paper and that's all you need. I mean, if you get really good and you start selling your, your paintings, you would probably want to invest a little more money and buy nicer paper. And you'll love how it works. I mean, the difference between just painting on this paper and a piece of copy paper is huge. And then having really fancy paper is super nice. But we're not really there yet, are we? So here's something that you can do. Watercolor paper, you can do what's called stretching it, and you can cut your paper, tape it down to a, a surface like this that's not gonna bend. Um, this is painter's tape. You can do your painting, and then um, when it's dry, you can peel the paint off, the tape off, and you have really clean edges, and it's a very lovely effect. So I'm gonna just do a really quick little um, example and I'm gonna do like, this is what I always do an example of because it's quick and um, really easy, but I'm not, I don't have a photo to look at. That's another thing, but I'm just gonna do like a lemon and a lime here and just show you. So I, I did a little um, horizon line there so they'll look like they're sitting on a table. And I'm drawing really lightly because for the most part, you won't be able to erase your pencil lines, so you don't want dark lines there. Um, these are pretty uh, lumpy, but that's okay. So I'm putting my painting on top of my palette just because that's what I have for room. So I'm going to do, first, I'm going to do a really wet background. I'm going to paint around my lemons and limes with just plain, semi-clean water. I'm painting with this water all the way to the edge. Like that. And now I'm going to drop in some color in the background. I know that my lemons and limes I'm going to be using um, yellows and greens and oranges, so I'm going to choose more like purples for the background. And that's pretty dark, so I'm going to just kind of add more water here and see if that will just kind of fade on out a little bit. Another thing that you can do is when you have a really wet background, you can sprinkle salt into your background and it will absorb little dots of color. That's the way a lot of people do like stars in the sky. They'll do a really dark purple blue sky and then they'll sprinkle big chunks of salt and leave it overnight. And then when it's totally, totally, totally dry, you scrape the salt off and it's absorbed little tiny specks of color, which is fun. Um, I think I'm gonna put just a little bit of blue in there too while it's wet. Okay, so right now, if I started painting this lemon yellow and I got up to this point right here that yellow is going to go right into my purple. So I don't want to do that. Now, one, another thing that you can do, you can't erase with watercolor, but you can remove some amounts of color. Like this 
has a big um, glob of water that I know is never going to dry in time for this demonstration. So I'm just sticking the corner of my napkin into it just to kind of suck up some of that extra water. I don't really want to pat on top of it because if I did right now, it would leave like little marks where I patted on it. I don't really want to do that. So I can though put, put my napkin like along the edge and just kind of like scoot in there a little bit. Now I'm going to put, um, I guess I'm going to start painting this lemon and just see if I can get really close to the edge without actually touching the purple. So this I'm doing wet on dry using a good bit of paint on dry paper. I'm getting really close, but I'm not touching that purple. Y'all know I'm not patient, so. I'm gonna put a little bit of um, orange, and I think that, let's see. That orange is okay. I thought it might be a little too strong, but it's all right. I can put a little more yellow on top of that. And then a lot of times lemons have a little uh, green in them, too. I don't know if y'all can see it on camera, but the my pencil line from where I drew my horizon line, I can see it going right across my lemon there. So that's something, if I were doing this and I really wanted to do it right, I completely would have erased that out, but there's your lesson you can learn from me. Um, all right, so I'll let that be my lemon and I'm gonna do my line. Again, I don't want my lime to run into my lemon, even though the colors would be beautiful together. I need to be careful not to do that. Now that's a pretty strong green, so I'm gonna get some water on my brush and kind of pull that out more. Um, one of the things that when in the classroom when we're painting, it's it's a beautiful part of watercolor, but it also requires patience. And the more patient you are, the uh, better your results will be. But using layers in watercolor is what watercolor to me is all about. Layers that you can see. So, <laughs> I just got purple in my line. Do y'all see that? Um, so there you go, impatiently, Ann. Um, so, you know, you can paint today all of this stuff and then in an hour come back and put another layer of paint over this lemon that doesn't completely cover the first layer, but it builds it up and you just keep building up and building up and building up. And that's how you get really beautiful depth, like, um, like, for example, on this rat, you know, I probably, I came in first and painted really pale green on his body, and then I left that alone, and then I came back later and added more of a medium green and added more texture onto him, and then I came back later and added a darker green here, and then at the end, I took a really skinny dry brush and a dry paint and did all this purple outlining. I mean, you you know just from watching me today that this could not have been done in one sitting. There's no way, because it would just been a big glob. I mean, if you'll notice the teeth, you know, just to be able to paint this and not paint his scary teeth um, and let them get messed up with the background or whatever, it just takes patience and time to do that. So, um, but I guess maybe one reason I like it so much, I am very impatient. I don't have to wait that long for paint to dry to be able to come back and do layer and layer. So maybe I didn't do this in one sitting, but knowing me, I definitely did it in 
one afternoon or night because that's just how I, I I'm just really impatient so I have to let it dry but um, it doesn't take that long some people use a hair dryer now if I were to use a hair dryer right now this lime has so much water on it that it would totally blow the paint into places I didn't want it to go so um, you have to be careful about using things like that to quickly dry watercolor. Now it wouldn't hurt, it wouldn't hurt acrylic paint to use a hair dryer, but you know this. Even though I'm holding it this way, if I keep holding it that straight up like this, before long the gravity will win, and a green drip will start dripping down into the purple. So, you know, don't push your look. Um, all right, I'm going to put something down here on the bottom, like a color for the table. Um, I think I'll do this pink. I love this pink. I think the reason I love liquid watercolors is because the colors are so bold. It's kind of hard to get colors like this using your kindergarten kit. They just typically aren't this intense. The colors aren't. Or you have to spend a lot of time creating layers and layers and layers to get it to build up that um, bold and vibrant. So um, that I think that's another reason I like them. These are very popular among art teachers. The liquid watercolors are because they're they're very inexpensive. They last a long time. Uh, they wash out of children's clothing. The colors are very bright and vivid. That's how I discovered these is from um, elementary school art teachers that I follow. I'd never had uh, liquid watercolors before that. So I put a little purple underneath my lemon and lime to kind of create like a shadow on the table. Um, it's kind of taken over though. It's bleeding because I'm, you know, rushing through this. But now <clears throat> the next step for this, I really can't do anything else to this painting right now. But um, the next thing would be allow this to dry, come back in, put more layers on top of it. Um, another option would be at some point to take the skinny sharpie and put all sorts of details in it. Um, one thing I love to do with my sharpie, and I think I was saying that I did this on this one, is when this dries and you see how the how the color kind of separates into different areas and little speckles show up. I love to go in and like define those areas just like I did in this background. You know, I definitely didn't create all of these spaces in my background before I painted. That's after I painted my background and it was dry, you know, there were these shapes that were created with my paint and I came in and outlined those. Well, I love to do that. And some of them are very, very subtle areas. But, um, and then I know that's probably how a lot of these little areas came to be is that I just discovered those areas in my paint. Like this is a really good example of that here. All of the divisions of color that happened, I went in and like picked those out with my marker and just started playing with that. So um, it's really fun to take your watercolors to another level. Um,